Good afternoon and welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining uh, this press conference here at the annual meeting uh, of the World Economic Forum 2016 in Davos. This press conference is dedicated to the launch of the one billion challenge. Coalition, I'm, I hear it's the one billion coalition and it's indeed an important point. And uh, you can see uh, uh, with the diversity of this panel um, that the first step for, for, for this coalition has already been done. Without further ado, let me introduce uh, uh, my panel uh, to you today. Uh, I'm joined to my immediate left by al Hajj Assi, the Secretary General of the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies based in Geneva. Um, to his left, we are joined by Cecilia Reyes, the Chief Risk Officer and Regional Chairman, Asia Pacific of uh, Zurich Insurance Group. Right in the center of the panel, uh, we are joined by Sia Khan, who is the Vice President, Initiatives and Strategy uh, at the Rockefeller Foundation. And all the way down to the line uh, of the panel, we are joined by Anthony Lake, who is the Executive uh, Director of the United Nations Children Fund, or UNICEF as you know it. We are also hopeful that we will later be joined by Ertherin Cousin, the Executive Director of United Nations World Food Program. Um, she is on her way, um, so she might be here uh, any minute. Um, without further ado, um, I see um, One Billion Coalition. So um, what, what is the One Billion Coalition? What are you trying to achieve with it? And why is it so important um, to bring these partners together to the coalition? Please. Thank you very much. <coughs> Uh, first of all, to uh, recognize you know, that the scale and magnitude of uh, the kind of uh, challenges we face today are quite unique. I think we have unprecedented number you know, of people in situations of vulnerability today, unprecedented numbers of people on the move, you know, some uh, even affirming that we've never seen anything like that since the Second World War. We are seeing uh, people who are suffering multiple deprivations and they happen to be the same because they live in those places that are more prone to disasters and they live in the same places you know, where governance you know, is not you know, the norm and conflicts are getting protracted. And because of that, so we are, are developing responses you know, individually, looking at it from different angles, uh, context specific, as well as you know, from the perspective of the different constituencies that we are working on. And those efforts, you know, have to be recognized. And it's being recognition of uh, those efforts that we think we should go for a coalition, a coalition that validates all the work which has been done by so many partners, and I'm so pleased to be joined, you know, by those who are on the front line and uh, leading those response from a development perspective, you know, from an emergency and humanitarian point of view, realizing throughout our journey that those lines are getting blurred and blurred. We need to not only do that effectively, but we need to do it on the long term. That requires a long term engagement, but we need, it to do, to need to do it also at a scale where it matters, hence the billion. So we do believe and we are really strongly you know, motivated you know, by the uh, commitment that we are seeing, by all the elan of solidarity that it is being expressed here that if we join our forces and to use you know some Davos words here then if a capital of a billion there are so many that could sh you know claim a share you know of it and contributing into you know reaching uh, that goal that's why we want to see a platform a of partnership a platform of mutual learning a platform of mutual support a platform also you know, where we can consolidate and preserve the gains that we've made so far and link it you know, to the other very important goals you know, that we all have agreed on at an international level and project ourselves in a sustainable manner in the future. So I'm very pleased to commit the uh, International Federation of 190 national societies in the world, 17 million volunteers on the ground, to work hand in hand you know, with the leaders that are joining us here today and the many more out there that we hope you know will be finding this platform attractive enough to bring you know their contribution to it thank you very much i see cecilia uh, over to you um just last week the world economic forum in partnership with zurich launched the global risk report um so uh, risk and resilience building resilience are, are clearly on the top of your agenda um I understand also that you are one of the, the first movers, so to speak, from the private sector to join this coalition. Uh, tell us a bit what you're doing to build resilience and why you're joining this coalition. 
Thank you very much. Well, the private sector has an important role to play uh, to promote resilience uh, around the world. So Zurich uh, can provide its own resources, its unique skills and, and expertise to help the most vulnerable in the world, but we know that it's not enough. It's not enough to move the needle. So we therefore look to collaboration with organizations with complementary skills and expertise to bring to the table. And a very concrete example of this, this, this work happening right in the front lines is the, the Zurich Flood Resilience Program, where Zurich looks to invest 50 million in the first five years of this, uh, this, this program to enhance resilience to floods at the community level. So this is very much in line with the thinking of the One Billion Coalition. The, the Zurich Flood Resilience Program brings together the skills and expertise of a variety of players to provide a holistic uh, framework to tackle the flood risk. So this consists of uh, the expertise brought to bear by the flood risk research at Wharton School and other research institutions with community organizations like the IFRC and practical actions, organizations with, with global reach, and of course, Zurich's expertise in hazard and risk management. And with a very much a participatory approach, i.e. working with the communities, we've designed a portfolio of sustainable um, actions to actually tackle flood risk and integrating risk management in developmental programs. So we have such programs and projects, pilots actually working on the ground in Mexico, in Peru, in Indonesia, and, and Nepal. And we seek to demonstrate that you know, benefits of pre-event risk reduction very much outweighs the post-event disaster relief. And we're integrating risk management in developmental projects and activities happening at the various uh, communities. Furthermore, we're also working with the, the Rockefeller Foundation and the Global Resilience Partnership to bring the same approach to tackling this time water uh, challenges. So clean, clean water challenges in water deprived areas of the world. And then finally, of course, uh, Zurich is a, a large institutional investor. So we own and manage $200 billion of our own investments. And in fact, the whole insurance industry collectively owns and manages $24 trillion of, of assets. And there is a very important role to play for private capital and capital market solutions to tackling such global challenges. So through responsible investments, we find solutions to community challenges. So we're, for example, one of the biggest investors in green bonds. We invest in private equity impact uh, investments through um, microinsurance, microfinance, to promote financial inclusiveness in these uh, communities. So in short, we really need collaboration and partnership, in fact, this is what we call a coalition, to provide at scale solutions to such global, large scale challenges that we face. Thank you very much, uh, Cecilia. Ertherin, we gave you some time to, to catch your <laughs> breath after, after running here to join us. Thank you, we're very pleased to have you. Uh, let's go over to you. The World Food, Food Program is often seen as an organization that responds uh, to, to, to disasters that are already happening. Um, what is your perspective on resilience and why are you active in building resilience? Well, let me say that we still must respond when conflicts and shocks occur to ensure that we save lives and that no one goes hungry. But we also, as has been stated, must begin to perform the work that will provide the opportunity for us to create food systems that ensure nutritious food to all people. And when I say all people, I'm talking about the 80, the 80 million people that we would normally serve with food, 
with, with food assistance, those people should have access to food in their communities based upon the development of agricultural value chains that support the ability for farmers to not only grow food but to sell enough so that everyone in their communities can purchase food at a reasonable amount. So it's not about making just making food available, it's making it accessible. But it's also about ensuring that when we support these kind, these kind of agricultural value chain improvements that they're focused on ensuring that we're not just talking about large farmers. We're focusing on smallholder farmers who are often the most vulnerable people in the community in those rural areas and that we are focusing on them to ensure that we're creating durable solutions, not programmatic solutions. WFP launched just yesterday a new platform called the Patient Procurement Platform with five businesses, five large businesses here in, the, in Davos with a commitment to supporting the tools that are necessary, a bank, the banking community to support access to capital, the seeds and, uh, and fertilizer community to support access to inputs that will provide at a reasonable price that will provide the, the yields that smallholder needs, but also with off takers to ensure that we are building markets that are durable, that provide an opportunity for that kind of economic growth that is not just short term, but sustainable. But we also are, are working with governments to support the kind of social protection and safety net programs like school meals that are knitted up with education programs with partners like UNICEF to ensure that they become a pull factor for bringing children to school on a regular basis and providing them with nutritious diets that will keep, that will give them the ability and the mental capacity to learn in school, that provide the types of social, social safety net programs that ensure access to micronutrient rich foods for women during the first thousand days. And so these are the kinds of activities that if we are investing in them on a multi-year basis, that we begin to change lives so that when a shock and crisis occurs, those who are most vulnerable can withstand those shocks mm. and not go hungry. Thank you very much. Sia, uh, let's go over to you. Rockefeller Foundation um, has also been a, a very, very active in responding to some of the world's largest disasters. And you also had, for example, the Resilient Cities program in the past. So, so what role does resilience play for the, for the Rockefeller Foundation? And why do you think this one billion uh, coalition uh, is, uh, is such a great initiative? Sure, thank you. And I just want to say how excited it is to be here uh, today. About a decade ago, when the Rockefeller Foundation first started investing in resilience, it was a much more lonely space to be in. And here I get to sit at a table with so many wonderful colleagues uh, who are working on similar things and talking about the same thing, and most importantly, thinking about how we partner and bring our capabilities together. Um, and to have this happen at the World Economic Forum is really the perfect venue uh, to have this kind of conversation. So we're very excited about this. For about the last decade, the Rockefeller Foundation's invested about $500 million or so in resilience building activities. And they range from helping the city of New Orleans recover after Hurricane Katrina to the fields of Ethiopia when they were facing the consequences of climate change. And there's probably no other organization that knows the face of disaster uh, than the IFRC. And it's, it's uh, tremendous that you are leading this initiative on the One Billion Coalition. And it's no surprise that you're at the front line of that. And that really is at the heart of resilience. Uh, the way we look at resilience is that it is the capability that allows people to prepare for, withstand, and recover from, and sometimes recover from more strongly, facing a range of shocks and stresses. And these can be climate change effects, economic shocks. We saw what happened in West Africa with Ebola, uh, health stresses and uh, pandemics. And uh, the world is becoming a more and more complicated place, and we're getting more and more interconnected with all these systems. So focusing on resilience is really important for us if we want to help particularly the poor, vulnerable people. And, and we believe that the investments that can be made here, and Cecilia, you touched on this a little bit uh, from the business perspective, we think that this not only lessens the impacts of those disasters, 
but actually starts to build capabilities that can create benefits right now in terms of jobs, in terms of better spaces. Resilient cities tend to be pleasant cities <coughs> and inclusive cities to live in as well. And it's critical that we maximize these investments and the value of these investments. Um, there's a shocking statistic that one in three development dollars goes to waste when a natural disaster hits. And so we have to think about how do we promote development in a way so it can be more resilient to these shocks and stresses. And simultaneously, when we have to spend money on immediate uh, response for humanitarian, how do we help that contribute to resilience? And it's this very key alignment between the humanitarian and development sectors that's at the heart of the idea behind the Global Resilience Partnership, uh, which is a partnership that we launched with our partners USAID and CETA in 2014 uh, with a joint investment of $150 million. And today that partnership has grown, and we're thrilled that Zurich joined us in August as our first private sector partner. And that not only demonstrates the vision on their part, but also that everyone has a stake in building resilience. Everyone in the partnership is committed to sharing and coordinating resources, scaling innovations, and building open source data platforms and monitoring systems for all who are working in geographies. And we're thrilled to be aligned with the One Billion Coalition to bring all of that uh, to bear and to learn from you as well. And as the Rockefeller Foundation, we're also for fortunate to have worked with many of the partners uh, on the stage. UNICEF, for example, uh, is applying and thinking about a resilient health system framework that we worked on in Sierra Leone. And the WFP is a longtime collaborator uh, who's pioneering Africa risk capacity is just an amazing example of a tool for building resilience to climate change. And indeed, across all of our work, we've learned that building resilience requires constant innovation, uh, which is in what in part makes the uh, Africa risk capacity so remarkable and to ensure that we're always ahead of our challenges and breaking from practices that actually make us vulnerable. And so like any innovation, this requires partnerships across civil society, donors, governments, and the private sector. So we applaud the IFRC for their bold vision for a more resilient future. We're very much looking forward to partnering and contributing what we can. Thank you, CEO. Anthony, I'd like to invite you to share your perspective from UNICEF uh, on resilience. Um, W what you're doing and where you think um, the, the One Billion Coalition is, uh, is a helpful way to do that. Thanks very much. Uh, hello? Hello? Yeah, it's, is it's it live? Good. Yeah. Uh, let me take as a point of departure the, the uh, Sustainable Development Goals, just to build it out a little first. Uh, you cannot, and let me put it in terms simply of common sense, you cannot reach the development goals that were let, uh, set out at the General Assembly in last September unless you include all of those people who are caught in humanitarian crises. For example, in education, for over 40 percent of the children who are out of school are caught in conflict areas. So you have to integrate, uh, as the United Nations and many others are still struggling to do, both the development and the humanitarian response. Beyond that, you have to have resilient development, which integrates also the problems and the effects of climate change, which has created so many of the humanitarian disasters and the conflicts that are creating uh, all of those, uh, all that misery and all those people who are trapped in these uh, uh, humanitarian crises. Uh, the COP21 agreement was a wonderful thing. It was a diplomatic triumph, but if you perfectly implement all of the pledges that all of the governments made, the planet is still going to heat at over three degrees Celsius above pre-industrial uh, levels. That's, th that's three degrees. The planet now is at one degree mm. uh, Celsius, and the ice caps are melting. Mm. So it is entirely predictable that we are going to see more of these humanitarian crises uh, as we go along up to 2030, the deadline for the uh, Sustainable Development Goals uh, and beyond. Therefore, we must have resilient development. It must, therefore, concentrate on the most vulnerable and disadvantaged communities because it is the poorest areas mm. that are the most vulnerable mm. and the least prepared. Mm. And of course, at UNICEF, but this is not special pleading, we would argue that the most vulnerable of all are the children and especially the children living in these areas. For example, they're the ones that suffer most from the diseases, diarrhea, cholera, and others that come with these disasters. They're the ones whose schools are the most vulnerable. Uh, they're the ones 
Actually, when you talk about air pollution, since children breathe twice as fast, uh, which I hadn't known until recently, uh, therefore they're the most vulnerable to the pollution. So we have to concentrate on integrating climate change, humanitarian responses, development work, all together as we go forward, or we have no chance of reaching uh, the sustainable development goals. Mm. And more importantly, we have no chance of helping all of these children and adults who are so at risk. Therefore, we think the One Billion Coalition is a tremendous idea, and particularly the way it focuses uh, on communities as well as nations, because this battle will be fought in building sustainable uh, and uh, resilient development at the community level, as I saw, for example, when I visited Tonagawa uh, a couple of years ago, uh, a, a repeat visit. I was there just after the tsunami uh, and then in Japan, and then I was there uh, a year later, and I could see how they were rebuilding in a very resilient way, uh, and the youth were putting up markers to show where the high water mark was so that you could go there, et cetera, et cetera. That's the kind of local action mm -hmm. that the One Billion Coalition is talking about, focusing on, and we're very proud to be a supporter of it. Thank you, Anthony. I see. Let me go back to you. Um, we have we have people on the panel here who are who are kind of leading the effort in resilience. So so huge experts on the topic. But to have the one billion coalition to, uh, together to have one billion acts of resilience, um, how can how can people join? How can the people here in Davos, the, the CEOs, the heads of state, the ministers, how can they support the coalition? But also, how can the people watching the live stream uh, join the coalition as individuals? I think the. Uh, People who are here are leaders in their own right in the design and implementers of their own programs, but they are also conveners mm -hmm. of large you know, partnerships. The UNICEF is a convener of uh, large partnerships you know, around children, but also around issues that matter to children, from nutrition you know, to education to protection of children. And all those aspects, they constitute a network of a community of carers that are contributing the same goal. We heard, you know, WFP, you know, designing and implementing program in its own right, but reaching out to the private sector and also having out there a large network of partners and partnership. The same can be said about the Rockefeller mm -hmm. Foundation, Zurich Insurance, and as well as the IFRC. We, that's why we think that, you know, not only are we offering our own contribution to it, but we are offering also our partnership. And we do believe that that platform will give us the critical mass that will go to the B word. You know, the one billion is really to communicate the scale and the magnitude, you know, that we would like to reach. You know, we could take two billion too. You know, that is absolutely fine. But let's get out of the M word to the B word, you know, to engage, you know, in the longer term mm -hmm. so that we start, you know, making a difference, you know, in the lives, you know, of the so many who are suffering the multiple deprivation and reinforce the uh, very strong message you know, of Mr. Lake that unless we walk the last and extra mile to the hardest to reach and the most vulnerable, we will not you know, get there. And we also commit to accompany you know, those who are in the same path to, to reach you know, those hardest to reach. Thank you very much. I think this was a pow very powerful call for action uh, for, for everyone here and, uh, and around the world. Um, thank you very much. I, w I know, mindful of your full schedule, we're, we're almost at the end of this press conferences. Uh, let's see if there are any questions on the floor. Uh, we have a microphone. Um, if there are no questions, uh, I, it's my honor to thank you very much for joining us here. Um, One Billion Coalition. Uh, check it out on Twitter. Check it out on the websites. You will also find uh, information on it on the World Economic Forum's website. I see we do have a question there. Can we get the microphone over to the lady there, please? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'm from Nikkei Group. Um, Nikkei, um, Nikkei Plus 10 is the uh, title of our uh, show. And I'm from Japan. My name is Maoko Kotani. I've met you, Miss Cousin. <laughs> it's very nice to see you again. Um, uh, my question is, uh, this annual meeting's uh, major theme is about the fourth uh, industrial revolution. And, and plus, they have major five themes uh, 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 right in the uh, well, on top of that, um, uh, what I was going to ask was about the um, about this. One of the major theme is about the large scale 
of involuntary migration, which means that there, there are uh, thousands of people moving out from their country, and of course the children are involved as well. And so I, I was wondering how that would affect your organization, and how, what uh, I would like to know what we can do for that. Thank you very much. So the question, how uh, can we provide resilience, or how can we make these especially vulnerable communities uh, more resilient? Um, any volunteers to answer that one? Anthony, you want to? I'm sorry. Uh, unfortunately, if you look at all of the trends, uh, I think we have to assume that this is not a temporary phenomenon, mm. the huge refugee and migrant flows that this is something the world is going to have to work on. Uh, and that is why uh, I certainly, and I think all of us here, certainly welcome all the attention to this issue about how the world uh, can cope with it. And remember, it's not just Europe, uh, but a majority of the refugees, uh, internally displaced people, and migrants are uh, in developing countries. So this is a phenomenon we have to deal with, and we have to deal with it also at its root causes, which brings us back to the point about the importance of resilient uh, development. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, in all the ways that we've been talking about, uh, we can no longer put disaster risk reduction in one box and humanitarian responses in another box and development in another box, but we all have to not only act in a more uh, coherent way, uh, but before action you have to think in a more coherent way about seeing all of this whole. And to reiterate, it begins at the community level, uh, and that is why uh, something as broad and deep uh, as the uh, One Billion Coalition is so important, not just in its actions, but in helping us to think about this problem in a different way. Can I just add on to that, and I agree with everything Tony said, and in very basic terms, when another, word, another set of words for resilience is providing people with hope and opportunity giving people the ability to know that this, when the shocks come, because it's not if, it's when they come, when you're the poorest and most vulnerable, mm -hmm. that you have the ability to, to move past that shock, to endure that shock. And that requires that we invest in the jobs, the education, the access to nutritious food all year round for all people. We commit it to a universal agenda. And we must acknowledge that that requires us, as been stated, to reach the furthest behind first. Mm -hmm. And these are the kinds of actions that will make a difference for those, for those that we serve. Uh, could I add one point to come back to? And I lose track of which industrial revolution we're talking about. Uh, perhaps it's a question of my age, uh, since I, I think I was grown, uh, born before the, the first. But anyway. Uh, one of the ways that we have, things that we have to emphasize as we respond to this is innovation, mm -hmm. and especially mm -hmm. taking advantage of uh, uh, the revolution in communications uh, technologies. So for example, uh, one of the things you need to know at the community level is uh, what are the problems in the community, who knows better than the people in the community, and to hear from them. We began a few years ago using SMS texting, something called you report. Mm -hmm. Uh, began in Uganda, uh, as I believe you were involved, in fact. Uh, he is a refugee from uh, UNICEF, for full disclosure. Uh, and uh, through it, it began in Uganda, now it's spread to uh, 15, 16 or more uh, countries. We have a million and a half youth who are reporting from their communities on conditions of various kinds, including environmental com conditions. And I was very struck at the uh, Rio Plus 20 conference that the Ugandan Minister of, uh, in the Environment took with him a U reporter and during the Rio conference was having the U reporter get in touch with youth throughout Uganda who were reporting on environmental conditions in their communities. So if we're going to have a community-based approach, uh, we can use technologies like rapid SMS tech, uh, texting to not only know what's going on in the communities, but then also to reach out to the communities uh, to help them uh, at a technical level even uh, prepare themselves for their future. 
Thank you very much. It's the fourth industrial revolution, but hopefully we are losing track of counting because so many uh, people are joining the One Billion Coalition. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much uh, for all your insights. Uh, I think this was uh, was a great panel. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.